boom. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are still on site in Manhattan, in New York City, New York. We are now by Central Park. We are super excited for this episode and very grateful to be talking about all things authoring, being a New York Times bestseller, doing things like writing about your own human guinea pigging, your own quantifying self, doing things like gratitude, all different kinds of cool stuff. We are sitting down with AJ Jacobs. Hello. Hello, Alan. Thank you. <laughs> Great to be here. Thanks a thousand, of course. Thanks a thousand, of course, yes. Um, AJ Jacobs, for those that don't know, is a New York Times bestselling author. He's the author of six books, which are all very interesting. Highly recommend checking them out. The links are in the bio. Most recently, the author of Thanks a Thousand, which takes us through a really fun journey of thanking everyone that's involved in his morning cup of coffee, which ends up being pretty much thousands and even more people, which we'll get to. <laughs> really excited to talk about that. Um, as you guys know, the importance of gratitude is huge. And he's also a contributing editor for Esquire and NPR and also a writer for the New York Times and other magazines. AJ, thanks a lot for coming on to the show. I'm super blessed for this episode. I am delighted to be here. I'm a fan. <laughs> yay, yay. Okay. Um, all right, let's start with, we love starting with big history synthesis. So, okay, humans have now found themselves as stewards of Earth, and here we are, and there's a complex civilization happening. How, what is your synthesis on what's going on in humanity? I love starting with a wide lens. Why not, <laughs> right? I think that's great. Well, uh, a couple of thoughts. One is that Despite the flood of negative news every day, you know, for 24 hours a day, uh, in the long view, I do think our species has done some good. I'm in the Steven Pinker camp mm -hmm. that, uh, that overall life is better. The good old days were not good. The good old days were the worst. They were violent, uh, sexist, racist, dangerous, smelly. I mean, you just read about... New York City a couple hundred years ago with the walls of horse manure on the side of the streets. Um, so that uh, when I get depressed about or annoyed about not getting wireless, I think I have a three word mantra, which is surgery without anesthesia. Because that's like, you know, if I were born 150 years earlier, that's one of the things I would have to undergo. So that's one side of it overall, I think, the trend is in the good direction, but I do think that we face an inflection point right now where we've got the climate crisis and a couple other things like AI where we, uh, we need to make sure that we continue in the right direction and we need to take some drastic steps, otherwise the direction is going to go right down. So we could, we're on the verge I think of either the most amazing time in human civilization uh, or the darkest time and so it's kind of up to us okay gr great great synthesis um yes there is we live in great times now we've done a good job building this civilization the standard of living's gone up a lot at the same time it's time to, for us to come together as one this unity for that, sure. that we got to get to in order to help get to the next thousand years oh great yeah yeah and that's a theme of a lot of my books we can yes. talk about yes yeah, tribalism okay. is uh, yeah a dangerous, dangerous notion. Yeah, yeah, because the tribe is Earth. Yeah, the tribe is Earth. Yeah. Or you could even yeah. say the tribe is uh, sentient beings. Who, sentient you know, beings. So we don't know yeah. who else there is, but uh, yeah. but yeah, the, That's we're good all one. we're all one tribe, and uh, yeah, it's unfortunate. Evolution did some things right and some things not so good. So uh, yeah, tribalism is is obviously had survival value but now it's kind of working against us. We can now manipulate people's emotions and neural prosthetics so we can Im just embed uh, empathy and uh, non-tribal uh, instincts. I am into, all for it. Listen. Yeah, yeah, so we yeah. can figure out how to actually move forward. Um, okay, this is actually this is a good segue into, you know, you were saying that this is part of what you write about in, in the books. Now, this is, this is very interesting because AJ is one of those authors that 
he his writing is all about a, a lot about um, running experiments on his life. Right, that's <laughs> exactly it. The human guinea pig. The human angle. guinea pig. Yeah, yeah. And tell us about this human guinea pig angle. Your yeah, in your most recent book, you were just talking with your son, and your son was like, "Well, if you were truly dedicated to that dad, you would actually go do it." Right. And then you were like, "Okay, I'm I would do it." Doing that, for it. You. that to me is the yeah. I mean, to just to back up, I. I love writing, um, and I do love writing first per about my experience. My, my, my childhood, though, was not that interesting. It was, uh, you know, there some people like Frank McCourt can write about their wild childhoods in Ireland. Mine was, you know, not... So, so I figure if I want to write about myself, I got to put myself into some interesting situations, mm -hmm. and that's what I do. So I will do an experiment. Uh, if I'm interested in knowledge, I decided to read the Encyclopedia Britannica from A to Z and try to learn everything in the world and what is the meaning of knowledge. Religion, I wanted to figure out about religion, so why not live it? Live by the rules of the Bible, like live as if you're Moses. Uh, so that, and, and then the new one, as you mentioned, is... Uh, is about gratitude. The origin of the new one was, I had been reading all about how important gratitude is and how we are wired with a negative bias uh, to know that, you know, you hear a hundred compliments and a single insult. What do you remember? The insult. So I, I wanted to fight that. So I would say these prayers of Thanksgiving before a meal. I started a ritual, a practice. Uh, but the trick is, I'm not religious, I'm agnostic. So. Instead of thanking God, I would say, well, I'd like to thank the, the people who made this possible, the, the tomato farmer, uh, the woman at the, the cashier at the grocer. And I would do this, and one of my sons rightly pointed out that this was kind of lame because those people are not in the apartment. They can't hear. They're getting nothing out of it. If I were committed, I would go out and thank these people in person. And a little, you know, light bulb went off, and so I was like, "That is an interesting idea. That could be a project, a book." So uh, that's when I spent the next six months going around the world, uh, thanking everyone who had even the tiniest part in my cup of coffee, because you realize it, it is hundreds, thousands of people. Yeah. It's uh, you know, the farmer, the barista, the the biologist who worked on the coffee beans, the logo designer the trucker, the guy who painted yellow lines in the road so that the truck didn't veer into traffic. Yeah. You know, it is, uh, it yeah. takes, it doesn't take a village to make a cup of coffee, it takes the globe. So it goes back to this theme of connecting and we are all, uh, you know, this tribalism is dangerous. So that was, uh, that was my most recent. I love how you come up with the ideas for this and it's so inspirational because yeah, you aim to make your own life so interesting that you can write about it and then show people how to really interestingly live qu quantifying experiments that they can learn from, learn really important wisdoms from. Right, I hope so and I try, yeah, the, the point is I have, I do it so you don't have to but you can come along on the journey yeah. and uh, as you and I have talked about, I, I, am, I am a big believer and evangelist for people experimenting on their own lives. Yeah. And you don't need to go and grow a huge beard like Moses. It, it can be little tweaks. You can try a new toothpaste every month. Uh, you can uh, take a new route on your walk to work. But, uh, but I do think the more novelty you can introduce to your brain, the more supple the brain stays, the more creative, the better you are at solving problems, yes. the more compassion you have when you can see the world through different points of view. So I am all yeah. for ex everyone experimenting with their own lives. Yeah, yeah, you heard that. That, that means change things up in your life more frequently, uh, get new lenses of seeing the world, and that that's good. That's good. It's it's also like a test. Like, can you can you do this for a year? A lot of it is like mm, that's true. You, know, you testing your own limits and like, can you can right. you do it? Yeah, I like yeah. that. Yeah, it's like a goal goal setting and uh, absolutely. Well, how did you even decide on writing being something that you were so passionate about in the first place? Well, I think I grew up. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I wasn't athletic, I wasn't like a social superstar, but the one positive trait that I think I did have was curiosity. I loved reading about 
the most random <laughs> topics or going on field trips. I remember in high school I went on a field trip to the Scientology Center and I never believed in Scientology, but I just loved hearing them make their pitch. <laughs> so uh, I thought, is there a way I can continue this uh, to, to be curious professionally? And writing seemed one way to do it. Yeah, yeah. That's good. I, I, like, I like hearing the, the origins of, of writing stories because um, we're, we're, we're quickly approaching on uh, a big attention economy and mm. it's and it's important to find one's medium video like the show audio maybe like a podcast writing mm. like articles books etc posts and designing cool illustrations like we were talking about as well these are it's important to find that medium because we want to capture people's attention to let them know hey we're saying important things yeah and yeah so. i hope so but i mean one thing that I liked is, is in the experimental uh, uh, phase that we were talking about, I do like to dabble in different media. So yeah, you've done so many uh, TED Talks. I like, yeah, I love giving. I, and this is not something that came natural to me. I, I, I hated speaking. I mean, part of the reason I was drawn to writing is because it's a, a solitary pursuit. And, uh, you know, I wasn't very good on stage, but I... I basically, and we can talk about this, the, the whole idea of, uh, of acting as if. So I forced myself to be like, I, you know what, I'm comfortable on stage, even though I totally wasn't. And I now, after years of doing this, I've come to love it. And I love speaking in public and doing interviews. My first interview on a radio show was so bad that they had to cut me off in the middle because I was stuttering. I just stuttered on one word. I what I forget what it was like. I I I I, and after thirty seconds, the DJ is like, "Okay, thank you. That was AJ Jacobs." And boop, and I'm out. And I was like, "Oh, that was one of the worst, most humiliating experiences of my life." But I pledge, I'm gonna get better. That is such an important story to share. I'm so happy that you're so comfortable with your story and vulnerability to to share that because. It, you went into a zone that was very uncomfortable for you and you don't you and you didn't turn around and say I, I can never do this again you kept going you persisted and that persistence has now brought you to multiple TED stages and whatnot and you're so much more comfortable with speaking you're cracking jokes you're making the audience laugh as you're teaching them it's your real content is super good now and for people at home wherever you're watching this take those risks even though we're not going to be good right away on the first three-pointer over time we become better i love that you say that yeah that is a big theme in in my life and in all of my work is failure you know there's it's a huge part of everything and uh people ask me how i come up with my ideas and, and partly it's a numbers game i you know i do come up with a lot of ideas <laughs> yeah. but 98 percent of them suck they're just terrible and dumb but there is that two percent that resonates, that works. So uh, yeah, I'm always, uh, and I try to teach my kids, uh, I try to tell them about failure. You know, I come home from work and I'm like, I pitched this idea and the editor practically hung up on me. And that's okay, because yeah. I'll, uh, I'll yeah. you know, you gotta just, as you say, keep going. See yeah. what works, what doesn't. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're taking that lesson to the kids. You also, you mentioned this, I'm happy you did that. Your the ideas we always have so many ideas but I, ideas are you know worth pennies the execution of them is worth everything and when you when you're, you're right that we typically have lots and lots of them and then we only pick a couple to actually build on um, within our lives um, you've specifically chosen the ideas that you build on that have some sort of a, a, a value for other people. So rather than um, doing things that may that may, people may see as like why you know someone writing about their childhood that may not have had that interesting of a childhood. Right. Yeah. You decide to go. I'm gonna go for a year of reading <laughs> the encyclopedia from A to Z, and I'm gonna. 
I'm gonna write about what that's like to do that process. So I wanna actually go through, so I'm really happy your ideas are so interesting that other people can um, learn from what your experiences are with them. I wanna actually go through the the other books you've authored um, in short bursts because I want people to get an idea of what it's like to come up with ideas that other people may find valuable that they can then um, potentially be inspired to come up with their own ideas mm. and make videos or Great. books about them. So let's. Love it. Let's go through them. Um, so it's all relative. Uh, there's a, a deep ancestry of interconnection with everyone. Right. This one was about family and, uh, and again, tribalism. The It's All Relative was a book that started because I got an email out of the blue a few years ago from this guy who said, you don't know me, but I'm your 12th cousin. And I thought, of course, he was going to ask me to wire $10,000 to Nigeria. But, the, but it turned out he was legitimate, and he's part of this group of scientists and researchers who are helping to build a family tree. Not, it's not a tree, it's a forest. And the goal is to connect every human being on Earth yes. in one big seven billion person family tree, which is crazy. It's a great, like, you know, a moonshot. And right now they have not, they don't have, they have about 150 million, which is still an astounding amount. And you can go online and, and it's done through DNA testing, through um, sort of crowdsourcing, and, uh, and you can go on these sites and figure out how you're related to someone you didn't think you, the one I remember, I, I memorized it, is um, Barack Obama is my fifth great aunt's husband's brother's wife's seventh great nephew. So we're very close. Uh, but I love the whole idea of yeah. Kevin Bacon. We're six degrees yes. every, and everyone is Kevin Bacon. And that was why I was drawn to it as a book, as to explore this idea that we are all connected. And as, as we were talking about it, this idea of us versus them, that definitely made sense evolutionarily when you were a tribe. But now we've got these worldwide problems yeah, like yeah, climate change. Yeah. We can't. We don't have that luxury of uh, of being tribal. We've got to all be the one tribe. So this was a nudge. Can we use this heuristic as a nudge to make us more um, uh, open to working with others? And there is some evidence that that it it works. There's they did an experiment at Harvard where they told Israelis and Palestinians uh, how closely they were related through mm -hmm. DNA, mm -hmm. and the ones who were told that we're more willing to work yeah. and, and we're more open-minded and nego uh, willing to negotiate. So there is some evidence that this is a, is a good sort of a good trick, heuristic nudge in the right direction. So that was that, was that book. And again, this is such an important put, nudge in the direction of unity, of interconnectedness of all of us coming from a seed of life, of seed of evolution. And here we find ourselves, why are we fighting? Yeah. Yes. I yes. agree. Um, okay, that's a, that's, a, that's a really cool one. I like that one. How about we talk about, you know, living biblically. This is all about living by the Bible for a year. Taking it at its word. And, uh, and this came about because I grew up in a very secular home. Uh, as I say in the book, I'm, I'm Jewish, but I'm Jewish in the same way the Olive Garden is Italian. Uh, no Jew offense. Jew-ish. Jew-ish. <laughs> Emphasis on the ish. Exactly. Uh, but I was very interested in religion and what to teach my kids. You know, and why does half the, or two thirds of the world believe in it? Why have they embraced rationality? So I wanted to A, see what I was missing and can parts of religion help with my life? Yeah. Uh, and B, I wanted to, uh, I think there's a very dangerous strain uh, of fundamentalism. People who say, let's take the Bible literally. Homosexuality is a sin because there it is in the Bible. And I wanted to show, well, you are taking parts of the Bible literally, but I'm going to show you what it's like to take all, all the it. Bible literally, be the ultimate fundamentalist, you know, stone adulterers. I used pebbles, so I didn't get in jail. Um, but the Bible says you cannot wear clothes of different fabrics woven together. So no poly cotton blends. Uh, you know, the Bible says you cannot say the names of pagan gods. So when you say something like Wednesday, or which is named after Odin or the planet Venus, you are committing a, a really 
uh, an abomination. Whoa. Uh, so uh, you can't shave. You can't shave. The corners of your beard was the rule, and I didn't know where the corners where were. Where are the corners? So, right here. <laughs> it's a debatable. You got to ask your rabbi. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was that was the idea, and I did. So I wanted to do both. I wanted an earnest exploration of what is what is good and unifying in religion, and what uh, and also expose that we should not be. Um, closed-minded and literal about it. So, uh, and I do think there are parts, the, the idea of community and ethical behavior, um, I like that, but in a secular context, sort of like, um, what's his, Alan de Botain, is that how you say his name? He's a writer who talks about sort of secular religion, uh, like, you know, every Sunday coming together to have a group of people and talk about ethical issues and yep. stories, but you don't need exactly. the, uh, exactly. the God component. Yep, yep, that's a new big movement. And again, uh, AJ is all about nuance, as you can tell. So he's finding good in the Bible and applying it to his life and teaching people about it. And he's also saying, this is what happens if you follow it fundamentally. And as a fundamentalist, and then you have to, uh, f you encounter all these kind of archaic-esque um, I, rules and so yeah so this I is love a, that you say that we I, evolve this is how we evolve right? right yeah and yeah nuance is is very hard in this and as we were talking but you know it doesn't it doesn't sell as much as like the radical black and white yeah, yeah, yeah. but as we talked about you know one of the few black and white issues for me is that the world is not black and white you yeah. know the one of the only Certainties I have is that certainty is dangerous and uh, yeah, that yeah. you do have to look at the, the subtleties. Yes. The good and the bad. Yes, yes. And then um, the know-it-all, which is, this is something that I also did in my youth, not all the way A to Z, but it was definitely lots of enjoying looking through all of the different entries in the encyclopedia, because right. this is a great way to learn about the world. I love that you're a fellow reader. And I also <laughs> love that you say in your youth, because you are still in your youth. <laughs> I am so impressed of what you've done at your, like Thanks, at, at your age, uh, I was, I think, you know, my greatest accomplishment was like eating three pizzas. I don't know what it was, but it was <laughs> not this. Uh, but yeah, this one was, again, I wanted to uh, try to uh, uh, imbibe all knowledge in the world and see how it changed me, what wisdom I could come out with. Uh, and it was a, so I read the encyclopedia from A to Z and it was a crazy long book. It took me a year and a half and it was, uh, <laughs> I mean, they were dangerous to it. Uh, uh, I became a little too enthusiastic about my knowledge, and my wife started to fine me. She penalized me one dollar for every irrelevant fact I inserted into conversation. So I, um, uh, I definitely, uh, it was hard on me and on the family. But uh, I do think there were some takeaways. You know, I've forgotten ninety-nine percent of it. Yeah, but yeah. but the bigger takeaways, one is. What we talked about earlier, the good old days were horrible. Um, and another was the, the sense of humility, epistemological humility, that there's so much we don't know. And you know, even after reading the encyclopedia, even if I could remember it, there's still tons that's not in there. And realizing that, uh, I think it's very important and not not and being open minded not being a know it all and being a no acknowledging how little we know and that's you know all all these sages throughout history have said the same but it was astounding to me to read about things that i had barely heard about or never heard about which were so important to realize like the taiping rebellion in china which happened the same time as our civil war uh, but our civil war killed about six or seven hundred thousand people. In the Taiping Rebellion, which was China's civil war, 20 million people Holy died. Cow. And I had barely heard of it, if at all. Uh, I mean, the only connection I had was General So was the, the leader of the, uh, one of the Chinese armies, and he is famous for his chicken dish. Like, that was my only connection, is General So's chicken. Whoa. But it is a remarkable story, and... 20 million 20 people. million people, and we barely know, know about, about it. So it, yeah. it, is, it is, it was a wake-up call about how biased and uh, our information is. And, and again, instead of satiating my curiosity, it just made me more curious to keep learning. 
this fit into the one percent of things you retained because it was just like an awakening like i didn't know that 20 million people died in a civil war in china right yeah there was such mind-blowing stuff, stuff in, there. in there and uh that i knew so little about yeah it's very humbling yep. yeah 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 i do think humility is uh and as i like to say i am the most humble man in the world. I am the <laughs> king of humility. I'm, I'm really king. great at it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How about um, how about my life as an experiment? That was an anthology, a collection of about uh, ten different experiments I did on myself uh, for a, a month each. And one of them, for instance, was this movement called radical honesty, mm -hmm. where there's a psychologist in Virginia who believes that. You should not, you should never lie. But he goes further. He says, whatever's on your mind should come out of your mouth. No filter. So like if you have a crush on your wife's sister, you should tell your wife and tell the sister. So I was like, interesting. So I tried it for a couple of months. And yes, it was the worst two months of my life. And so, because, because it's just not a great way to go about for the marriage, for, for dealing with colleagues and bosses. Uh, that said, it was not a waste of time because there were some, t some, there is a way to be radically honest that will enhance your life. I, I do believe, like, I don't believe in saying everything, like, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the yeah. classic, your, your butt looks fat in that dress is <laughs> not helping the world. But I do think there's radical positive honesty. And, yes. Uh, and that That's we don't good. do that enough, like yeah. acknowledging people or thanking them or yes, yes. Uh, or you know calling people that, yeah. a mentor that you haven't spoken yeah, to in 15 lot. years yeah. and saying how much they meant to you so that was my takeaway on radical positive radical honesty i love how you jammed you were like i'm just gonna jam 10 experiments into <laughs> a year and, and write about all this <laughs> yeah that was uh, well it came about because i used to write for esquire or i do still but um i wrote a lot for esquire and I thought that I had 10 articles that I could put together. But when I went back and read them, I only had like four that I felt held up. So then I had to go do six more. So it was more work than I anticipated, but it turned out okay. And then Drop Dead Healthy. So this was also quite the like, it was quite o awakening because it also exposes how unhealthy um, we really are in our exercising habits and our eating habits um, even in our in our stress uh, habits uh, mm. things like noise pollution you pointed out uh, being something that is you were on on the streets here in New York when you're standing there across the street from the the construction duh, 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 into the ground and c cabs are honking and it's just it's w there's a big difference between that and tranquilly sitting in a quiet space for space. sure yeah. yeah that was yeah. interesting i did not know about the the dangers of noise pollution that on the physical that is bad for your heart uh, and yeah. there is some research on it uh i wouldn't put it at a hundred percent but it's very interesting research but that one started just because i was in terrible shape um getting sick a lot and i uh i decided my wife was said, I don't want to be a widow when I'm 40 years old. You got to do something. So that's when I decided, yeah. like with the Bible, I'm going to dive in and try to follow every piece of health advice in the world, which is, of course, thousands, and many of them contradict each other. But I decided to try everything, try every diet, exercise regimen. Um, and, and what I liked is uh, that, as you had mentioned, health is much wider than just diet and excess. It's not about getting that six pack abs. It's about uh, a life well lived. And uh, things like um, stress is so important. Sleep is so important. And one of the big takeaways was friends and a social circle yes. is so key. Yes. That like, you know, people who have a tight knit social circle or family or friends are much healthier, healthier. live longer. Yeah, yeah. And and so that was part of the, the lesson that there is uh, you can't. You can be unhealthily obsessed with your health. Like if you are all about spending all your time exercising and finding just the right organic stock of asparagus, that might not be the best for your health because 
you, you might be ignoring chances to go out with friends and, and bond and talk about yeah. deeper issues. So yeah, that, there was a bit of liberation in that uh, being healthy uh, partially means not being obsessed with being healthy. Yeah, yeah. There's, there were so many uh, crazy ones in there. Um, everything from, you know, wiping the the remotes and the and the iPhones mm. in the because they're just uh, they're just a, a, a city of germs oh, that yeah. are going on there. There's um, there's the amount of like w a walking helmet because oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are some people who adopt that for, who does? for statistical reason. I, I have not yeah, adopted. Yeah, yeah. And the germs are interesting because I think there's a middle ground. I think. You know, there is the danger of a, an epidemic or pandemic, and germs can be very dangerous. But on the other hand, you can go That's overboard. Right. That's right. And, um, you gotta build the immune system up. Yeah, yeah there yeah. is some theories right. about True that. Theory. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I've actually moved away from germophobia partly yeah. because our current president is a germaphobe. And I thought about it, uh. and I think it reflects an irrational strain <coughs> of thinking, a fear of the different and the outside and there are some mm. really interesting studies linking like fe fear of immigration to germophobia like seeing that as like an invasion uh, from the outside so that i've moved away from the being obsessed about germs although yeah, yeah. we should wash our hands and and that, that's also one of the reasons uh, of of Hitler's sort of ideology as well as the um, that there was uh, inferior sort of germs of, of, of other people that were not as uh, yeah uh, exactly yeah, he's very biological all about like pure blood and yeah, things yeah. like that yeah so so this is another sort of uh, of, a, of an important like treat each other humanize each other you un, union of with evolution with each other as as we move forward um and figuring out how to best do that with uh, yeah yeah thank goodness we have some decentral I'm, I'm a big fan of decentralization technologies um which i think are going to be a big player in this unity um okay let's get to let's get to um thanks a thousand so this gratitude journey is so crucial because there's actually um, physiological effects that occur with gratitude which after over time uh, actually become part you just you you, you vibe with gr you vibe with it it starts changing <laughs> your essence and you leave like a more positive wake behind you mm, yeah well yeah i love the science behind it which, which is what originally was like oh my god i gotta be more grateful because it does it affects all, there are studies that show you recover more quickly from illnesses and surgery when you keep a gratitude journal or you mm. know you're more likely you're to uh, stave off depression uh, you, you sleep better you eat better it's ridiculous how much it affects uh, every part of your life and I was like uh oh because again I had the negative bias and I still do I still battle it every day all of us for, are just so attracted to that one negative versus the hundred right. positive positive. and I think if you believe the evolutionary psychologist which I do in this yes, case yes. it had value you know you Back wanted then, to yeah. really notice that lion yeah, you wanted correct. to notice the one poison mushroom out of a hundred yeah. so but unfortunately now that we don't live on the savanna it can be a real impediment to happiness yeah, yeah, and so this this journey in I think another crucial part. So like, what I think the two main for me for takeaways for thanks a thousand the in sheer importance of leaving a positive wake behind you with gratitude everywhere you go on a daily basis and what that does to your physiology and the world around you. And the other one is this just deep profound understanding of the interconnectedness of everything in terms of globalization and how commodities move around the world. And so this is this is so important because it's not only the you know the farmer and the beans at the location but then it's the trucks that tr take that to the actual store and then it's this thanking everyone in the store thanking the people that laid the asphalt that that for the trucker to drive thanking the cashiers thanking it, there's so many people and this is where you said that it can be an infinite Oh yeah, I could have written, you know, an 18,000 page book and taken the next 60 years of my life to thank all the people. Because yeah, once you go to the people who 
uh, paint the yellow lines in the row? You know, what about who made the paint and who <laughs> made the buckets for the paint? And, you know, you could just go on and on forever. And I love that, uh, this idea of interconnectedness. And, and I also think it's important uh, because uh, I think one fear is that being too grateful will make you complacent. Mm. You'll be like, oh, everything's so wonderful. I'm so grateful for everything. But actually, the evidence shows the opposite. The evidence shows pe when people are more grateful, they're more pro-social, they're more willing to go out and pay it forward, try to help others. And I found that because when I'm in a depressed state, you know, um, uh, I am focused on how do I get out of this? How do I, you know, I'm not thinking about other people. I'm thinking about myself. Um, but the, the beautiful uh, paradox is that the, one of the best ways to get out of this is to help other people. And uh, by helping other people, you, uh, it triggers some happiness in yourself. So anyway, that, uh, that's just a thought like that happiness, I mean, that gratitude is, is a spark for action. It's not just yeah. all about yourself. It's, all, it's a two-way street. Yeah, yeah. And there's, you mentioned the fear of you know, being complacent, but then there's also another one which you, of course, gave this really good understanding of how it's, um, it's not. But then there's also this, um, this, this sort of fear of being taken advantage of potentially mm. and whatnot. Um, but I, I think if, if we can get to a point where enough of an of a avalanche effect is going on in the world of everyone dosing up on love and gratitude, there will be no room for people mm. to try and take advantage because everyone will have avalanche effect into that love. That's and, a very nice thought. Yeah, I hope yeah. that. I, mean, they, I hope I, so too. I read an interesting uh, article about uh, this notion of the opposite of paranoia uh, is called pronoia. And paranoia is the feeling everyone's out to get you. Yeah. And pronoia is the feeling that everyone is out secretly trying to help you. And I don't, <laughs> I don't know, like empirically so it's good. probably not true that everyone is out to help you, but I think there are people, some people who are out to help you, like who are, so. Um, pronoia. Pronoia. You know what's interesting about that is that if you do believe that you are a character in this in a, in a, in a game in a, in a simulation, you're leveling up, that you could potentially pronoia with the creator of the simulation <laughs> and, and work your way to level up more easily with oh, the I with like these that. little experiences around you. Let's yeah. hope the the creator of the simulation is a, a nice person and not a psych, <laughs> psycho. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's a little pronoia. Yeah, that's. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I also want to, I want to talk about some of the very basic um, ways of 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 uh, of bringing this into um, into into our lives and and how it sort of humanizes us on mm. a, on a deeper scale. When we we frequently um, we very infrequently look at each other in the eyes with this passion to understand how the person became who they are right. and have a deep sense of, of 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 humanizing each other. I love that. Yeah. I mean, the first person I thanked in my uh, to uh, for my coffee was the barista who works at the local cafe and uh, so I said, you know, thank you for my coffee. And she said, thank you for thanking me. And I had to cut it off there. I didn't want to go into this infinite loop. But one of the things, I asked her about what it's like to be a barista. And she said, it's, it's not easy because you're encountering people in a dangerous state, pre-caffeination. Uh, and that a lot of people don't e even look up from their iPhones. They just like hand the credit card. They treat her like a robot. And you know, eventually maybe there will be a robot barista, but for now we have humans. And so she talked about the importance of just that two seconds of eye contact to remind both of you that you're human. It's, ha it's important for both of you. Uh, and it's such a small thing, tiny, you know, you're not gonna win a Nobel for it, but it's, it has such a big impact. It does, Making yeah. eye contact with people you deal with every day. Yep, yep. And there was another, I believe it's the Dalai Lama that also has expressed a, a deep amount of, of uh, e when people come into the sphere around him, he can't just uh, not ask them about their lives. Mm, I love that. Yeah. 
So then that's how you, when you're walking, yeah, but, but, but otherwise if you're walking down the street, you'd have to stop and ask every single person. So there's got to be some sort of a, yeah, of, a, of distinctions that you got to make between who you want to talk to. But like when you do sit down and potentially your Uber or Lyft or when you're um, sit in the front seat and actually strike up a conversation with where the person's from, what their life is like, yeah. uh, when you're passing over the yeah. card for a transaction, say, you know, thank you very much. Um, you know, right. I yeah, love that. Yeah. I actually just heard about a, a an Uber alternative called I think it's called the Blah Blah Car, where you can <laughs> when you order a car you can mark down whether you want to talk yeah. or you just want to say good. hi or you want silence. Sounds, yeah, yeah. I thought I love that because some people you know, may not be in the mood. And there's to talk. some drivers that don't want to talk too, mm. and there's drivers that do want to talk. So that's interesting. And there's the future of automation. You were mentioning a uh, uh, on a. Uh, uh, Barista, that is robotics. That already that already exists. We already have that um, in places like San Francisco and whatnot. But also, there's the an autonomous vehicles, the mood sensing capabilities of oh, AJ's in a non talkative mood, or mm. he is in a talkative mood. He'd like this type of music. He'd like this type of uh, etc. I love that. Yes, and um, equally, um, I wanna I wanna um, touch. Okay, on as we as we as we exit on thanks a thousand. I want to mention the importance of globalization mm. because we have now, and this is kind of also riding on that Pinker argument, the better angels of our nature, here we are. We are so much better off thanks to the ability for us to be so deeply interconnected, for us to be able to move things around the world with ease, to call each other around the world with ease. And I think this is a also a big testament to that is yeah. that you were able to take commercial aircraft places it's amazing. It's amazing. and use Google Translate if you need. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, as we talked about earlier, you know, everything is grays. So globalization uh, does have downsides, no doubt. I mean, especially the American um, lower middle class has been devastated by globalization. Uh, but I think, as you say, the upsides historically outweigh it and will continue to, which is uh, billions of people lifted out of extreme poverty in the last 50 years. Um, just this uh, amazing ability to sample other cultures uh, and, and, and go to other cultures. Uh, so I am, yeah, I am pro-globalization. I realize it's got downsides and we can work on making it better, but overall, I'm like, yeah, let's, um, you know, let's not re react by uh, closing off and trying to uh, stay in our little containers, uh, which is a, a big movement now of nationalism and, and xenophobia, uh, but overall not good for the human race. We've done a lot of moving too quickly, I think, in the last uh, century, especially where our population on the planet has exploded mm -hmm. so much um, well, from a billion to almost eight. And here we find ourselves not really taking the time to slow down and think about how we're how we're moving resources around the world and how we're uh, how how we're educating children to have at least a bare uh, basis of, of language and, and s fundamental skills that enable them mm -hmm. to to prosper through the artificial intelligence age, all this different kind of stuff. We're just, we kind of went through that hockey stick and we're riding it without really yeah. slowing down to, Great point. to think about. And there, there's only one experiment on this earth happening and that's the human experiment in the sense and um, and there's no pausing or rewinding. Um, there's, right. yeah, yeah. So, get yeah. Our, really <laughs> focus on getting our shit together in the next, okay. Um, okay, I wanna do a couple things on the way out. Um, the first thing is, I want you to teach people why it's so important. You've already mentioned this several times, but why is it so important to run these quantified experiments on yourself? And what sort of, and, and in, when doing it with a, um, and with an intention of, uh, of, of experiments that can bring good insight to you and other people when mm, you share it with them. Right. Uh, well, yeah, I'll just tell my experience and uh, uh, I just find it, it makes my life so much better to try things out and see what works because even a failed experiment, you're gonna learn something from it. Uh, and it, it could be small, for instance, in, 
in the Bible it says no, no gossiping. And so I tried that and yeah, that is not easy. You know, that is, that is built into us. Uh, and there is some argument to be made that some forms of gossip are actually helpful to humanity. Mm. But I think that the, the tendency to go immediately to the negative and get this schadenfreude out of other people's misery is just terrible. But, um, but spend a week trying not to gossip at all, just saying positive things about people. And I guarantee you, it'll be so hard, but so rewarding. So uh, as we talked about, you know, the brain, uh, neuroscientists, their catchphrase is when it, uh, when it fires together, it wires together. Mm -hmm. So when you do the same thing over and over, then you build these pathways, these ruts in the brain. And uh, sometimes it's good because it's a shortcut, but other times you get stuck in one way of thinking. So that's why I feel it's important to try different things. And I feel just on a global level, trying out more policies or, um, you know, the environment. I was just listening to uh, Dylan Matthews' great podcast, uh, Future Perfect, about uh, bioengineering. And are we going to have to start experimenting with, uh, you know, creating fake volcanoes to cool down the earth? And uh, I think we got to be open to it because we are, we can't, we can't dismiss it just because it's not natural. That's like a naturalistic fallacy. We've got to experiment. Mm -hmm. You you urge people to push themselves into experimentation, which then gives them a again a sort of a, um, a you they're, they're, you're kind of playing with life in a way in a, in a new and more interesting way. You're getting yourself out of a routine and you're being more creative and yeah. There's a lot of good here. I agree. So much good. Um, okay, couple. These are questions we usually ask uh, on the way out of every show, and and uh, I'm I'm interested to hear your thoughts or your answers on these questions. All right, I'll do my best. Okay, what is a core driving principle of yours? I would say don't be a jerk. Am a big fan of. Yeah. I would say um, when I try make decisions, I try to think in four quadrants. So the first is how will it affect me now. How will it affect me in the future? How will it affect others' happiness now? How will it affect others in the future? And I think yeah. for the first, when I was your age, it was all about the first two. But as I, I've gotten older, I try, and it's hard to focus on the other others, quadrants yeah. about other people. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you know, I am basically, uh, I, I do try to think what is the greatest good for the greatest number, and it's not an easy, it's not an easy, but it's a, it's a good goal. Well-being is a good goal, and nihilism is not that great. Nihilism will get you literally nothing. You even have a, a breakdown of, of, of slowing down and thinking, which is great. It's so great. It, oh, yeah, I'm a fan of... That's good. Uh, yeah, the, the idea of savoring is another big part of my... Uh, my core principle like that seeing yourself in your life as a collector of experiences yes. and a curator like you have a museum in your mind and you try to collect experiences yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, you also talk about how doing things like retaining a, a sense of gratitude over a long moment right can yeah can make that time feel like it's extended or for something. sure yeah, yeah. slowing down time slowing down. yeah um, yeah, you have a that, that that breakdown is both for your own short term versus long term, and then others as well. I like that a lot. Okay, how about if you could rebuild civilization from scratch? How would you design it? I love that question. I was just thinking about this yesterday um, about language, so I could focus on a million things, but let me just focus on language for one thing because I think one. Uh, strategy I would use is to redesign language so that there is no word for I believe. It would be everything would be probabilistic. There would be one word for I believe 10% and another for I believe 80%. I'm 80% sure of this. I'm 40% sure of this. Yeah. Because I think that would be so huge in acknowledging that we are not like if we can just put in 
the word probably into if we can use that word or uh, instead of certainty then we've got room to negotiate and figure out solutions so I would change language so that it is it has built-in probability and also I would de-emphasize nouns because like when you say that guy's such an asshole that's like saying he's he was an asshole, he is an asshole, he will be an asshole. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, very yeah. essentialist. Whereas I would try to change it to, that guy right now is acting in an asshole-like manner. And that gives you the opening like, maybe he's not always an asshole. Yeah, maybe yeah. we can help change him and he will be. Uh, and I think that's very important. So fewer nouns, more probability. Ooh, that's good, that's good. Thanks. Yeah, I like how you took it from the language and uh, probability perspective. That's good. I like that. It's great. Okay, how about, <clears throat> this wouldn't be simulation if we didn't ask you, are we in a simulation? <laughs> it's a good question. I don't know the, I mean, uh, sometimes I, I see the Elon Musk argument that the probability is that we are. I mean, I if we are, I really would have some words for the guy doing the simulation. And it's like, you can do better than this. Like, it's like some of the stuff that's happened in the last year is like a second rate screenwriter, you know, like having, I will tell you this, have, when Donald Trump was elected, it's for me w was some evidence that of the multiple world theory, uh, multiple universe, yeah. because I was always thinking if we live in infinite universes, why is our universe not weirder? Like, why don't I have like a, a purple elephant crashing through that bookcase right yeah, now? Because yeah. it could happen. Yeah. And then like this reality show host who's like a caricature uh, of everything became president. And I'm like, that's weird. Like that, that there are other universes looking at us like, you, you're the universe where Donald Trump became president? <laughs> so anyway, those are my random yeah. thoughts. I like that, that many worlds interpretation of the multiverses and where we have that, that weird, the weird line of code that was executed in <laughs> ours, which ended up being, <laughs> exactly. the, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, last question, AJ. Yes. What's the most beautiful thing in the world? Oh, well, that's a lovely question. Uh, I would say, um, well, I do think about beauty. Uh, I mean, one thing is I, I do think that the beauty bias of l treating attractive people better is a terrible thing. So, and that's like everything has its grays, blacks and whites. I do think beauty in that sense is a bad thing because, you know, like, um, it's not something you can control. And I think like ugly people, the discrimination against them is just horrible. So I would say that um, in general about beauty, but in term, if you think about beauty in terms of more conceptual, like not physical beauty, but uh, conceptual beauty, I would say one of the most beautiful things to be is when people have a conversation and uh, come to an understanding. That is pretty amazing mm -hmm. to me and yeah. that we can do that and we need a lot more of that. Yeah. Discourse that ends uh, with people's um, connection, connection between connection. people. Yeah. And, and, a, and a changed mind, which is very hard to yeah. do. Yeah. Uh, you know, we are really bad at changing our minds. So that is one of my goals as I, you know, for the next couple of decades, I'm gonna Me try too. to change my mind yeah. when the evidence shows. It shows so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, That's a great way to wrap. Um, this has been such an honor and a pleasure, AJ. My you, pleasure, I you, loved it. You are a huge role model for so many of us. Oh, yeah, thanks. We, we, gotta, we gotta learn how to better run these experiments in our lives and, and, and gain positive, uh, inf positive, just learn more about, about ourselves and the world that we live in by running these experiments and just the, this, this, mo this most recent one is so crucial. Thanks a thousand. 
This well, is so, so thank, important. Of course, yeah, thank they, you. Yeah, yeah, because how, how else can we build up these behaviors of gratitude around our world and also realize the interconnectedness of our world? There's so much good to take away from um, AJ's books. Go and check out the link in the bio to AJ's work. Also, we would love to hear from you. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Uh, build up the community, build up the dialogue amongst each other about some of the things we talked about. Also, go and build, go and run these experiments. Tell yourself you're gonna do something for a week and go do it for a week and see how it is and then go write about it or do a video about it and share it with your friends. And yeah, build the future, manifest your destiny into the world, everyone, and help join simulation also below. We would love your help in helping us scale everything that we're doing so we can continue coming on site to great places like this to talk to amazing people like AJ. Thanks again, everyone. Much love, and we will see you soon. Peace. Thank you for watching. Thank you. I'm very grateful for you. I'm very grateful for this interview. I'm very grateful for the people that made this equipment for us to be <laughs> able to use it. Uh, Me too. <laughs> we could do that for like six or seven Same hours. Way. That's the danger. <laughs> <laughs> it's an infinite loop. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I love it. I love it. You're yeah, you're doing the thanks at the beginning of dinner, and then it and then it, <laughs> it, just, it goes into you its, its never infinite eat. roots. Yeah, yeah you never eat. Okay. All right. All right. <clears throat> all right.